Hebrews chapter 7, uh, we left off at verse 3 concerning about Melchizedek. Now remember, Melchizedek is a very uh, mysterious biblical character. A lot of people are wondering who he is because supposedly he never dies. That's the idea. He doesn't seem to have a birth trace. So let me review very quickly here. There are four possibilities. We went through three of them. One, people plainly say it's Jesus Christ. However, the problem is, when we look at verse 3, it points out that Melchizedek is made like unto the Son of God, so that he is not the Son of God himself. The second thing is also, Jesus is supposed to come from Melchizedek's line. So if Melchizedek's the first starting point, how can Jesus come out after that unless you say two Jesuses, right? So it doesn't seem to make sense. Number two seems to be the strongest contender so far, and that is God in his pre-incarnate state. In other words, uh, the pre-incarnation, uh, the incarnation of Christ, you've heard of that phrase, that means God transformed himself into human form. And that is Jesus Christ when he bled and died on the cross. Amen. But there was a pre-incarnate time. So another time God appeared in human form before that. And the greatest evidence is the angel of the Lord. And why not Melchizedek himself? So we see in a passage at Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar saw the pre-incarnate form of God. He said the fourth man is made or is like the Son of God. So not Jesus himself, but it appears like Jesus Christ. So it would be more accurate to say pre-incarnate God, or you can say uh, Jesus Christ uh, before his incarnation, whatever you want to call it. But to say Jesus himself uh, would not be as accurate or more convincing compared to contender number two. Con contender number three was interesting because if we were to argue it was Shem, the Bible said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. That's the blessing he received from Noah. And when we look at Genesis 14, Melchizedek was able to bestow that same blessing. So Shem could be a possible contender. Another interesting thing is that during that time, it was a time a priest right. in Babel with Nimrod. Shem, some people, when they studied uh, Babylonian, uh, during Nimrod's times, during Babel's time, that Shem uh, was, a, was a priest, but the right line of priests. So then there were Shemite, uh, Semites from Shem's line who were the good priests, Nimrod's line who were the bad priests. So because of that, it's very possible that Shem could have been that Melchizedekian priesthood, so to speak. Uh, another thing is that where it says he has no birth, it could be simply referring to as a priesthood that has no record of birth. Could, that could be the explanation for the mystery of having no birth uh, from Hebrews 7.3. Another thing is where he was, uh, he's supposed to live forever. So how could that be Shem? His death is never recorded at all. It just said that he lived yeah. this amount of years, but it never said he died. So it's possible, like Enoch, he could have been raptured. Right? So that's the, in, that's the most interesting contender so far until we come to contender number four. <laughs> contender number four is just extremely wild, but it is very interesting. Uh, I'm, there are some Bible-believing preachers and books that uh, we read from the Bible Baptist bookstore who talk about this, which is very interesting. It, Melchizedek could be uh, one of the Adamic children or one of Adam and Eve's children before the actual fall. So in other words, before the fall, it's possible Adam and Eve may have had children. Now some of you might say, uh, why would you say that? Because it never mentioned uh, clearly from the Bible that Adam and Eve's very first child or very first children were Cain and Abel. So the thing is, we don't know how many children they had. Now, here are some itch interesting points why. First of all is when we go to Genesis 3. Let's start with Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now, if you were in our Genesis studies, we, we already covered a lot of uh, this, a lot of this interesting stuff. So if you want to hear more about it, I would recommend uh, listening to our Genesis study. Amen. 
All right, but let's go to Genesis 3 for now. <clears throat> now, notice uh, what Adam called his wife's name at verse 20. Verse 20. Assuming Adam and Eve didn't have any children yet, right? Mm -hmm. This is the passage where Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. So this is right at the fall. But notice what Adam called her. Verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. So he called his wife's name Eve at that time right when they left the garden, because she what? The the yeah. Was is the key. Yeah. She was, see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not is or will be. Oh, she yeah. was mm -hmm. the mother of all living. There's no living people or someone that she mothered unless there may have been, right? Mm -hmm. So if you say she never had any children that time, then why would it say she was the mother of all living? Oh, wow. So that's a very interesting point. Now, I'm not saying I believe in this, okay? And I'm not going to consider this as doctrine. But I believe that, uh, I do believe that in any uh, possible routes, if we're going to s discover Melchizedek, it'd be good that we discover all of them, right? All right, another thing is this. <clears throat> probably when you read verse 16, probably when you read that, that's the verse where God says, when you give birth to children, you're going to give birth to children in pain. Now, why would he say that to her if she never brought forth children before? Would she understand that? But if she brought forth children before, supposedly, let's say, she did give birth to children before, and God said, now your curse is, you're going to have pain from now on when you give birth to children. That would make a lot more sense about the curse she received, right? So uh, another one, which is probably stronger, believe it or not, is stronger, is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Genesis 1, 28. Notice when God created Adam and Eve, he commanded them mm -hmm. to start pr procreating, mm -hmm. to start producing children. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Wow. So Genesis 1, 28. And this is before the fall. We don't know how, how much time has passed by. Right. Genesis 128, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Right. See that? Yeah. Now, I never, I, I don't really know, okay? It might be a thing, but to be common knowledge, I don't think when a man and woman, once they get married... And all of a sudden, throughout ages of time, they never did something together. You know what I mean? No. Where they won't have children coming out. So I don't think it's something like that. All right. So if God gave them the ability to procreate. Right. Yeah. So there are uh, there are uh, families who aren't able to do that. But this is be after the fall. Yeah. This is before the fall. So this is when they're able to procreate easily. Yeah. So I don't think that. Starting from Genesis 128 all the way to 3, they did nothing. You know what I mean, Jelly Bean? Okay, so I'll just leave it like that. So the thing is this, is that it, 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 that's, it, it, it. Okay, so what I think is that there, it's very possible that throughout that uh, process of time, they could have had children. They could have had several, if not many children. It's very, very possible, especially Old Testament period is famously known up producing kids easily, yes. many kids easily at that time. So it's very possible Adam had children before the fall. If he had children before the fall, yes. then they were never kicked out of the garden, see? Yeah. Only Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they sinned. So yeah. if they were the ones kicked out of the garden and Adam and Eve's children, mm -hmm. they didn't fall and there was a tree of life over there still, and they partook in that tree of life, and they were still not in their fallen state, then they could be roaming around somewhere, some of these uh, Adamic yeah. children before the fall. So if uh, pre-fall Adamic children were around, they were roaming around, where did they go? Well, the gar they were still in the Garden of Eden then, right? Yes. But the Garden of Eden disappeared after the flood. So there's no mention of that. The only time it's indicated that the Garden of Eden was still around before the flood is due to Cain and Abel and also because of Genesis 3, God said, I'm going to put a flaming sword so that no one enters. 
So that garden, that access to the garden is still around, see? But after Noah's flood, the landscape changed, right? And then people tried to discover the Garden of Eden. You can't find it, so it disappeared. It's very possible then, as I've taught you in our Genesis study, is that the Garden of Eden is sunk down to hell. Yeah, mm -hmm. If it's sunk down to hell, the Garden of Eden, for some of you who don't know, it's called paradise. Yeah. Because it's called paradise, now remember, in the Old Testament, if you died, where could you go? Yeah, right. Now remember, uh, uh, we call paradise Abraham's bosom during the Old Testament times. What that was is it was below, uh, it was not up in heaven, it was below the earth. It was in the center of the earth. So if Adam died, where's he going to go, right? He can't go to heaven. He's got to go to Abraham's bosom. But Abraham wasn't born yet. So what was it called? What was it called? Eden or paradise? So uh, if it's the Garden of Eden sunk down, all right, to uh, the center of the earth, then when Adam died, he could go there. Which means then the Garden of Eden, it did not just disappear after the flood. It disappeared sometime long before the flood. It may have disappeared right at the fall. Wow, okay. At the fall of mankind, when God put that flaming sword, it could have opened up hell. The Eden could have fell down there, and then paradise, hence, it was where hell is located. So Old Testament saints, when they died, they could go down there. Now that just went, whoa, 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 whoa so much information. <laughs> all right. Now, I cannot give all the verses one by one on it, but let's just look at just a very few, okay? I'll give you a few. Go to the book of, uh, I didn't mark it down. That's my fault. So let's go to Ezekiel. Hopefully, hopefully I'll find it soon. All right, Ezekiel. What's that? 30. 30. You might, it's somewhere, somewhere in the 30s. Yeah. It's Ezekiel. It's not 30. Uh, 31. 31. It's 31. Ezekiel chapter 31. Now notice what happened to Eden, okay? Now this is describing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ezekiel 31, uh, verse 8. The cedars, the cedars in the garden of God, see, that's Eden, could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Well, we can guess that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, connected to Satan. You can see that, all right? It really sounds like that. Now, notice what the Bible says in verse 14. To the end, that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees and uh, stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death to the where? To the nether, parts. nether parts of the earth. They went down to the underworld. Yeah. So notice all the trees of Eden, including the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, went down to the underworld. With them that go down to the what? Pit. The pit. That's, uh, you know, that's another word that is aligned to hell. Uh, let's keep reading down. Go to verse 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to where? Hell, hell with them that descend into the pit and all the what? Trees of Eden. Trees of Eden. The choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell. See that? That's pretty plain. Now, a flaming sword, correct? Yeah. It was a flaming sword. Could that flaming sword be connected to hell? Yes, go to Isaiah. Isaiah. Go to Isaiah. Notice at the second advent of Jesus Christ, he actually does that. He comes down on Armageddon with a flaming sword out of his mouth. And that flaming sword, what it does when it slaughters his enemies, it opens up the uh, portal to hell. So his flaming sword can open up the portal to hell. Why then the Garden of Eden, it has a flaming sword. Similarly to Jesus. So couldn't it also open up the portal to hell? So go to Isaiah and uh, chapter, uh, like I said, I didn't mark these down, so I'm just going by memory here. Chapter 63, I think. Chapter 63. No, there's, it's not this one. It's not this one. 
Uh, I'll have to find a uh, different chapter. But this is about the second advent. We'll read this. Chapter 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh uh, from Edom with dyed gar garments from Basra? That's Jesus Christ. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Verse 3. I have trodden the wide and press alone, and of the people there was none uh, with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is in mine heart. So notice right here, Jesus Christ, he is conquering uh, the kings of the earth, stamps them out and uh, wipes them out. And there's blood that uh, reaches up uh, to his garments. And then the chapter, if anyone could help me out with that one, it's, uh, it is in Isaiah, but I just don't know that chapter. Uh, I don't know that chapter, but it mentions that hell opens up as he slaughters them. Uh, type down unicorn. It's somewhere in that chapter where it talks about the unicorn, actually. If you type down unicorn, th the chapter will come out very easily. Does anybody see anything there? Uh, 34, 34, thank you. Wow, that is way behind. Okay. Yes, 34. Let's see if this is it. The sword of the Lord. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, this is it. All right, here we go. Chapter 34, notice right here, verse 5. 34, verse 5. Notice God's sword. <clears throat> verse 5, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. All right, so that's the verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. That matches with Isaiah 63, right? So this is Armageddon. But look what happens here with this sword when he slaughters them. Verse 9, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into what? Brimstone. Brimstone and the land thereof shall become what? Burning, Burning pitch. pitch. Why, that sounds like the lake of fire or hell. But keep reading. It shall not be what? Quench night nor day, the smoke thereof shall go up forever. Wow, that's very plain. That's hell. That's hell. But um, last verse to convince you, if you're still skeptical, is 2 Thessalonians 1. All right, that sword is that flaming sword that gives hell fire. There's no doubt about it. When you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> Notice right here, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, when Jesus Christ comes down and slaughters the unbelievers at his second advent. In verse 7, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Look at verse 9, who shall be punished with what? Everlasting destruction. Well, that's pretty plain then. That's referring to hell. All right, if you look at Revelation 19, a sword comes out of his mouth. All right, so anyway, uh, that should be convincing enough that the flaming sword that's connecting 2 Thessalonians, Isaiah, and Revelation 19, it can open up hell. The flaming sword can open up hell. So in Genesis 3, we see a flaming sword. See that? So then, who's to say that it won't open up hell when it shows right here that it can? So then, the flaming sword that blocked the entrance to the Garden of Eden, it's very possible, if not likely, that it opened up hell and then Eden fell down into hell, especially since Ezekiel 31 told you that, right? And then where is Adam going to go then after he dies? So there has to be a paradise. There has to be an Eden down there, all right? Yeah. There's going to have to be that in there. Uh, let me just make this uh, simpler. I'll give you one more verse, all right? I pretty much, pretty much taught you verse by verse. But the last chapter, Revelation 22, right? Revelation. And then uh, we'll look at chapter... 22. Now I have a question for you. The tree of life, that's, uh, in, uh, that's in the Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. Do we agree with that? Yeah. We agree that the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Okay, if that's the case, then look at Revelation, I lied, chapter 2, sorry. Chapter 2, okay. 
chapter 2. Now, the Bible says in Genesis 2, the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. All right. Mm -hmm. Genesis 2 said the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. Yeah. Now, look at Revelation 2, yeah. verse 7, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise. Of God. paradise. Yeah. Matching with Genesis 2, Ooh. the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden, it calls it. So Eden, paradise, they're interchangeable there. That makes a lot more sense yeah. where Adam went to. Okay, then. That was from the top of my head. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 7. All right, Hebrews chapter 7. So Melchizedek, it's uh, very possible he could have been one of those uh, Adamic, uh, those pre-fall Adamic children. Again, pre-fall Adamic children was uh, roaming around, which could also explain when Cain, he, he was afraid somebody could kill him. Yeah. Yeah. If it's only Adam, Eve, and him in the world, why would he be afraid right. about a whole bunch of people after him unless some of the... Adamic children, at, before the fall, they can be roaming around. Yes. Uh, angels can roam around, right? right? Sons of God can roam around, right? Why not uh, these people as well? Because they didn't die yet. Wow. And they are eternal from the tree of life. Okay, anyway, a lot of food for thought, which is very interesting concerning Melchizedek. So that was perhaps the most interesting theory. All right. But again, like I said, theory, not doctrine. All right? Yeah. Sounds like good doctrine, though, you know, but, but it's theory, all right? It's pretty wild. All right, go to he uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and then verse 4. Now let's continue on uh, explaining verse by verse of the author's arguments. The author, he's bringing up Melchizedek for his following arguments here. Now I'm going to be explaining each and every word, so remember that. So <clears throat> when I read the verse and then I start explaining, Please look at the verse and see if my explanations match with every word in the verse, all right? So if it kind of sounds redundant or wordy, there's a reason behind that. It's because I'm trying to explain every word, okay? <clears throat> verse 4, now consider how great this man was. So uh, pa Paul is arguing that because he already discover, uh, discussed about Melchizedek, he wants the audience now to consider how great or how much better Melchizedek this man was compared to any other priest. That's why he's going to be bringing it down. Unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. This man was so great that uh, Abraham, who's known as the patriarch of the Jewish people, gave a tenth of the spoils of war that he conquered. <clears throat> so this is in Genesis 14. Remember that. In Genesis 14, uh, when you go back there, he was able to uh, fight in war and gain spoils. He gave a tenth to Melchizedek. All right, now when we look at uh, chapter 7 and then verse 5, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Meaning that Paul is saying, and for a certainty... Those who are from the Levitical priesthood, mm -hmm. those who are from the children of Levi that receive that office of the priesthood, they are commanded by the Lord, and it's commanded in the Old Testament that they're supposed to receive tithes. That's referring to a tenth of uh, certain goods, just like Abraham who gave a tenth of the spoils, which is tithes. So the Old Testament... Uh, people who live by the Old Testament law, they're commanded to give tithes to the priest. Continuing the second half of verse 5, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. So the author is saying right here, the people according to the law, those Old Testament Jews, those are the Levites' uh, brethren or their family members. Uh, even though they all came, so Levites and those Old Testament Jews came from Abraham's loin. So they come from his seed, from his, uh, uh, from his birth line. That's important to understand. 
You got to remember that because he's going to use that for the next argument why Melchizedekian priesthood is better than Levitical. So this is his reasoning. His reasoning is in verse 6, but he whose descent is not counted from them. So he's saying that Melchizedek, whose descent, whose genealogy, uh, whose birth line is not counted, what? He's not a part of those who uh, received tithes of Abraham. So he, his descent is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. So we see right here that Melchizedek in uh, birth line or his priesthood is not human, is not human. The ones uh, who are from Abraham's birth line, those who receive the tithes, so that's referring to the Levitical priest, obviously, right? From them receive tithes of Abraham. That's referring to the Levitical priest. They come from Abraham's loins, his birth line, and they're the ones who receive the tithes, okay? That's the idea. And Melchizedek was the one who blessed Abraham who had the promises of God. So notice right here, the idea is an elevation. Melchizedek is better than the Levitical uh, priests. Why? Because Melchizedek is the one who blessed Abraham, yeah. not the other way around. Showing the superiority of Melchizedek above Abraham and who comes from Abraham? The Levites. Mm -hmm. So you see that right here? It's showing that superiority still. Correct. <clears throat> Verse 7, and without contradiction, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So he's talking about that there is no argument against this. That's what he means, and without all contradiction. There's no, arg ar uh, there's no argument, there's no opposition against this statement. That the less, which is the Levites, uh, is blessed, they receive that blessing of the better from Melchizedek. Why are the Levites blessed from Melchizedek? Because they come from Abraham. Yes. And remember, Ab Melchizedek is the one who blessed Abraham. Yes. So that's the idea. Now, I'm going to look at verse 8. That's good. <clears throat> and here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. So notice right here at verse 8, and here men that die. That's referring that in this case, the, the, the Levites who are human and they die out, they're not immortal, they receive tithes. But there, so he's talking about, but that particular individual, that's what, but there he, so he's contrasting this, uh, the, the here and there. Here is Levites, there is Melchizedek. There he receiveth them. Uh, but Melchizedek, who's there, will receive the tithes, of whom it is witness that he liveth, which people can testify, they are eyewitnesses, that he's alive. Now, um, that statement can mean two things, which is very interesting. One is that it's just simple, giving a simple statement that during Genesis 14, Abraham and many other people were eyewitnesses and they saw what happened with Melchizedek blessing Abraham. Or it could mean that Paul took it as a matter of fact statement that people know Melchizedek is eternal. Because he starts out verse 1, 2, and 3, Melchizedek is eternal. Why would he give an outlandish statement like that unless Old Testament Jews took it as, yes, as a matter of fact, we already know that. So that means uh, it's possible. It was common knowledge to those Jews that Melchizedek is some uh, unique individual who's immortal and can pop out here and there roaming amongst us. Wow. And some people were eyewitnesses of that. Okay. So uh, an example is, oh man, I had an alien encounter. And then you hear these eyewitnesses and then it's strange stuff about UFO sightings, right? And aliens. Why, you know, why not with Adamic children, pre-fall Adamic children too? Think about that one. Uh, during the Old Testament times, 
there were human encounters with angels as well. And there were encounters during the early centuries of the fallen angels mingling with human bloodlines. So if those Arthurian legends are true, and those legends are true in Native America and in South America, which is during early centuries, not BCs, where they encountered fallen angels, then don't be surprised that they can do it too. So that could be the other meaning, uh, the other meaning where they were able to uh, be eyewitnesses. They were able to see or claim I encountered Melchizedek. That's something. Now, if we were to go back here at uh, verse 7 and verse 6, notice Paul says, let me repeat, without all contradiction. So there's no argument against this. The argument is what? The last, which is the Levites, they are blessed by the better Melchizedek. Okay, they receive the blessing. Think about this. Remember, why did they receive the blessing? Because Abraham received the blessing from Melchizedek, right? Why did Melchizedek bless Abraham? He gave the tithe first. When he gave the tithe first, when you look at Genesis 14, that's why Melchizedek blessed him for that. So what does that mean? That can match with Acts 20. And this is Pauline, all right? So when you get hyper-dispensationalists who uh, freak out and they said that tithing is unbiblical for New Testament Christians, uh, notice what Paul believed. He believed in giving. He believed in giving money to the Lord. Acts chapter 20, and then uh, notice right here uh, what Paul argued, and uh, he said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. When you look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is what? More blessed to give than to receive. So the power of giving, you receive more blessing. So the less, which, is, which can be you and I then, we can be more, uh, we can be blessed by the better, and Melchizedek pictures Jesus. Jesus Christ. If he is truly pre-incarnate God too, even more so. If, it, if Melchizedek is pre-incarnate God, and Abraham gave a, a, a tithe to him, why are Christians, uh, why shouldn't Christians as well? Do we think we're better than that? So a lot of people who try to debunk tithing and who hate to tithe and say Christians shouldn't tithe and stuff like that, that's very disturbing to me because if Abraham was able to give it to Melchizedek, who can be, who possibly is pre-incarnate God, God himself, why would Christians say, I don't want to give a tenth to God? That's pretty, I don't know, there's something wrong in there, you know? Right. Sounds like a wrong spirit to me. Now, don't get me wrong, I know that there are these charismatics online and they use Malachi and they said, you're supposed to give a tithe to the church and then <laughs> they try to uh, squeeze people out of their money. Right. Yeah. So I am not saying that there is a New Testament, please listen, I am not saying there is a New Testament command, you have to specifically give a tenth of your income. Because everybody, I understand, has different income levels. However, I do believe this. I do believe that when it comes to giving to the Lord financially, that a tenth is the least you can give. That's right. What you're going to have to give is your best. So it depends, see, now on your definition of best, right? Yeah. So if it turns out like a tenth of your income, you know, that th that's just way too much for you, for people who are poverty stricken or et cetera. Look, I'm not going to bash you on the head and I get it, okay? I get it on that one. So I stick to the definition of giving your best. I stick to the definition of giving your best. But for those of you who can give a tenth to the Lord, you gotta realize this, it's more than a tenth. You should be giving more than a tenth. You should be giving your best. Your best to the Lord. What does that mean? That means more than a tenth. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's even a stronger command yeah. you have to realize. Amen. So just because I say uh, there's no specific New Testament command to give a tenth or tithe, 
doesn't mean you catch a bigger break. Oh, whew, see, I don't have to give a 10. No, it's, it's worse for you. You have to give more than that. You have to give your best to the Lord. So why? Because you get blessed by the Lord. And you wonder why you're not getting blessed? Oh, it's quiet here. I don't know why it should be quiet. I'm, I assumed all of you tithed, right? Somebody must not have been tithing. All right. I'm going to look at the numbers at Sunday offering, see what happens after that. We're, we're, people are going to start giving after that, you know. Or it'll drop, you know. It'll drop. They're mad at Pastor. How dare you? I'll show you. And then we only get $10. You want a tenth? Here's $10, you know. So we'll probably have $10 by the end of Sunday, you know. But anyway... Uh, the point is, is that we get blessed by the Lord if we give to Him. That's right. Now, if you can't trust Him with a tenth of what you got, then it shows to me you hardly trust Him with anything you've got in your life. Wow, wow, wow. Which is why you're wondering you're struggling in, with your life. Preach. You're not willing to give up something to the Lord and trust Him with that. Preach. That's important to understand. All right. It's more than pocketbook here. You understand that this is more dealing with your heart. All right, go to Hebrews 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And then uh, we'll read verse 9, Hebrews chapter 7, and then uh, we'll read verse 9. And uh, as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Okay, so the argument is this. I'm going to explain each and every word here. So the author is arguing, and if you will allow me to say this part, let me also say this even more so, that Levi also received the tithes. Why? Uh, no, no, excuse me. Levi also paid the tithes. Now, you might say, why is the author arguing here that Levi also gave tithes to Melchizedek? That's pretty much of a far stretch to say. Levites weren't born yet. Ah, but they were born in Abraham. See, that's his argument. So because they come from Abraham's birth line, when Abraham gave the tithes to Melchizedek, in a sense, those Levites were giving it up to uh, Melchizedek too. That's what he's arguing. So the Levi who received the tithes, they also paid the tithes. Why? Because they were in Abraham. He, re he reasons in verse 10 that uh, because Levi was still in uh, Abraham's seed when Melchizedek uh, encountered Abraham and received the tithes. All right, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So the idea is this. He's arguing right here. I'm going to explain each and every word and phrase here. If, therefore, perfection is from the Levitical priesthood. If that Levitical priesthood is perfect, because it was under that time, people received the law. So he's going to connect this to the law here, Old Testament law. He's going to point out an argument, which you can guess. He's going to try to point out that the Old Testament law, we don't need it anymore. That's what he's going to reason it out. So this is how he works. He works it out by saying... What further need is there for another priesthood or another priest to come out from that Melchizedekian order when, after all, we got the Aaronic order, which is the Levitical priesthood, Aaron's order? So why not a priest after the order of Aaron? See that in that verse? Why not use this? Why should there be a priest from this, he's arguing? He's trying to get them thinking. If 
that, that priesthood is perfect, right? So why not this? Unless it's imperfect. So he's going to try to show them that the law is not that perfect. It's imperfect. Verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So he's trying to argue right here that this means then, if this Melchizedekian priesthood is superior, is more perfect than the Levitical priesthood, then he's saying that we shouldn't be going by this priesthood. We should be going by this priesthood. So this priesthood must be changed. That's what he's arguing. So hence this priesthood must be changed. And if this priesthood has to be changed, that means also what is changed? Old Testament law. All right, so did uh, my explanations match up with that verse? So make sure that those, every word in that verse matched up with all the explanation I told you so far. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So, in verse 13, he's saying, for he, so he's talking about Jesus Christ now, all right, from Melchizedek's line. So he's saying that Jesus Christ, of everything that I've just talked about to you, comes from, he's pertaining to another tribe. So he's not then from the tribe of Levite, see? He's saying then, if Jesus' priesthood is superior, right, and this is out of the way, what we do know from common knowledge about Jesus is he's not from this tribe, which is all imperfect. He had to come from a different tribe. And we know what that tribe is. That tribe is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's from here. So hence, see this? There's a change of priesthood. So notice how this Levitical priesthood is now getting uh, disannulled or canceled. The Bible actually says that. So don't be Seventh-day Adventist and get mad at me, all right? The verse said he disannulled it, okay, or canceled. I'll show you that later on, all right? So this now becomes canceled, and then... This one becomes the active priesthood where Jesus comes from. So that's his uh, reasoning. That's how he argues. If we keep reading here, uh, let's see. He says at the last part of verse 13, which we can guess that this other tribe, which is not Levites, there was no human who was ministering or giving attendance at the altar doing priestly work. Obviously, there is no tribe that did that in Judah. But here is something very interesting that I want to show you. So there's going to be several passages we're going to turn to. I want you to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now, King David is a picture or a type of Christ. We do know that. And he is from Judah's line. Now, notice something interesting here. We're going to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And then I want you to go to verse 26. 21, 26. Now, there was no man from that tribe who gave attendance at the altar, who did the priestly work. But look at this. 21, 26. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. Look at that. So the Lord answered David's prayer of what he built on the altar. Now, remember, Saul tried to do that. He was rebuked for that by Samuel. But in David's case, God granted and answered. So that's very interesting stuff. So uh, David is a type of Jesus Christ, which is why from Judah's tribe, that priesthood, you can see that the Lord is seeing it that way. So, Lord, so the Lord, even though 
he mentioned in the law, it's the Levites who do, who do it. He somehow sees that in Judah's tribe, there can be some sort of priestly office and function because he's seeing far ahead into the future that it's going to be Jesus Christ, my Amen. son, who will be Amen. doing that. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff. Now, uh, when we go back to our main text, go to Hebrews. We'll go to Hebrews chapter 7. And then verse 14, which is what I mentioned to you before a little bit. For it is evident. So it's, it's evident, that's self-explanatory, that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. That's pretty self-explanatory. Paul says that it's evident that Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. He sprang out. He came out of Judah. And this tribe, Moses mentioned nothing. He mentioned nothing about the priesthood. So the Lord saw something there as something special. Verse 15, and it is yet far more evident. Oh, there's something yet more, far more evident than what he just mentioned. What is that? For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. So what's even way more evident is that from um, similarly from Melchizedek, there's going to come out another priest like him, which shows the superiority, see, of Jesus Christ priesthood compared to the Levitical priesthood and other Old Testament priesthood. Because remember, he's writing to Hebrews here, so he's trying to argue so much how Christianity is superior uh, to Old Testament Judaism or how Jesus Christ is superior to their Old Testament law. Verse 16, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. So the author argues that Melchizedek or Jesus Christ from Melchizedek more specifically is made not, at, not after the Old Testament law. He's not built into, consisted from the Old Testament law. Now, the Bible calls the Old Testament law very carnal. You know what's that? Yeah. So if there's a Seventh-day Adventist who thinks he's more spiritual than you because he's observing certain diets in the Old Testament, tell him that, no, he's actually more carnal than you. <laughs> All right, well, any, anyway. So notice right there that uh, it's a carnal commandment. Why? Because it means fleshly. Yeah. It means physical. Yeah. Right. When we uh, continue reading onward, he says that Jesus Christ is not made within that uh, fleshly, physical stuff which the Old Testament law is based upon, but he's uh, made up after endless life, immortality, eternal life, and that's power that has more weight and authority. Verse 17 is his reasoning, his scriptural basis for that argument. Because... He testifieth, so the psalmist is testifying, is arguing that Jesus Christ is a priest forever after the Melchizedekian priesthood, after that Melchizedekian order. And again, that passage, like I told you before, is Psalm 110, 4. Psalm chapter 110, verse 4. Uh, that's a verse that you can use on Old Testament Jews. I've looked at the sources. It's, it's really funny how they argue that. So who is this person then, if not Jesus Christ? Because this, this person, whoever this person is, who's a priest after the order of Melchizedek forever, that's, uh, that sounds like God. That sounds like a deity right here. Now, Jews don't want to admit that, see? So then what they try to do is that they try to use old, real old Hebrew, because you don't know the Hebrew, and reinterpret words and play around with it. See, uh, the mentality of people trying to get around a verse by using Hebrew and Greek is not of the Holy Spirit. It shows you want to dodge the Holy Spirit telling you from the Word of God. All right. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 7 and then verse 18. Verse 18. 
For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So the author argues that, so because of all this, there is certainly a disannulling. There is a cancellation, a doing away of the Old Testament law. Why? Because how it went before, how it operated before, was so weak and it had no profit from that. That's the explanation from that verse. Wow. So Seventh-day Adventists might argue we have to keep the Old Testament law. We have to keep the Old Testament law because it's like as if it has authority. It's as if that you can profit out of it. But God says, no, the opposite. It's weak. It has no profit. How about that? So uh, this is the Seventh-day Adventist favorite verse. Go to Matthew 5. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, they're going to argue that Jesus Christ never came to break the law or to destroy the law. That's true, but even though he doesn't destroy the law, doesn't mean that he can't cancel it. Because look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, and then I'll show you why. Take, uh, put your hand in Matthew chapter 5, and then uh, your other hand, I want you to go to uh, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, and then what I want, uh, yeah, we'll just stay in Ephesians 2, okay? Uh, we could go to a third verse, but I ain't going to do that. All right, Matthew chapter 5, and then we'll look at verse 17, and then your other hand's at Ephesians 2. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think, that, uh, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. What does fulfill mean? Yeah. Fulfill <laughs> means there's an end to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so the law ends. Yeah. See, they, they think that fulfill means that I'm going to maintain it. I'm going to protect it. I'm going to keep, keep it. No, fulfill means he's going to put an end to it. Yeah. He's going to complete the entirety Amen. of the law Amen. to its ending point. Amen. So then look at Ephesians 2. Now, some Christians show Colossians 2 blouting out the handwriting of ordinances of, against us nailing it to the cross. So Christians argue, see, this verse from Colossians 2 says that uh, God wipes out the Old Testament law when Jesus died on the cross, and they will say, no, no, that's referring, the, uh, the ordinances against us was referring to the record of your sins, they would say. No, when you, uh, when you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and then look at verse 15, Ephesians 2, and verse 15, the Bible says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. So he abolished, he wiped out what is said, even the what? The law. law of commandments contained in ordinances. Yeah. So he abolished it. Wow. Yeah. That's a horrible word. Ooh. Abolished. He abolished the Old Testament law. Amen. How are you going to go around that? All right. So let's go back to Hebrews 7, wow. Hebrews 7. So your Seventh-day Adventist friends, they're not going to like those wordings. But that's, those are Bible wordings, not Amen. your wordings. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, go to Hebrews chapter 7. And then uh, we'll look at verse 19, Hebrews chapter 7. And then we'll read verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we... Uh, draw nigh unto God. So Paul argues that the Old Testament law didn't make anything perfect. What it did, though, is that it brought in a better hope. And what is that better hope? We were The access where we're able to come close to God, to have access to God. The law basically led to people to see the need of Calvary. So the example is go to Galatians. Three. Galatians 3. Looks like I cannot spend time debunking Calvinism. I really want to do that, but, <laughs> all right, but I'm not going to do that. All right. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 3, and then look at verse 24. Because the idea is, is that the, the Old Testament law, it shows you your sin. It shows you your wickedness. It shows you how you cannot be perfect to keep the entire law. 
So because of that, you realize you are a sinner. Yes. And that's why that law, see, in a sense, it leads you oh. to the need of, I need a sinless Savior to fulfill that law for me. Oh, I need His righteousness and for Him to save my soul. Amen. Amen. That's Amen. very important when you deal with people who think good works can save them. So you use the law against them, yep. show them their sins, show them they're not perfect oh, enough, okay. And then through that, then you make them see their need of Calvary. So look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, so that we can be saved by faith. Because the Old Testament law didn't make anything perfect. Now, I have to talk about dispensational salvation then. So I want you to... Uh, keep your hand at Galatians 3. Keep your hand at Galatians 3 and go to Job 1. Go to uh, Job 1. Now, the verse said that the law didn't make anyone perfect, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, but the, I beg to differ. The Old Testament says it differently. The Old Testament says people who followed the law or the commandments, that they were perfect. Wait, then there's a difference right here. Go to Job 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was what? Perfect, Perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, you and I know that he's not a, a sinless man. So there, then we know that there's a difference right here. We see right here he's known as perfect at Job 1, but then we see at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, the author argues that the law didn't make anyone perfect or that no one is perfect by that. So then what is the explanation here? Uh, the explanation is this. So quick review and then we'll call it a night, okay? Uh, if I have it. In dispensationalism, this is the cross of Christ. When we are to go backwards in the Old Testament time period, so let's put this as the Old Testament time period here. Now, remember this, they were under the law, right? As they were under the law, the law couldn't make them perfect. Because they couldn't be made perfect, they can't go to heaven then after that. So then, recall what I mentioned, that's why it was necessary they had to go to paradise below the earth, mm -hmm. not in heaven. Now, I already explained that in our previous verses. I'm not going to do that here. So they couldn't go to heaven. They had to go to paradise below the earth, which is where all sin is located, below the earth. That's where hell is, see? So here we receive salvation by faith, yes. not by works. Amen. Here, people had to do works. They had to follow the law. Yep. But remember, the law couldn't make them perfect. So... By following the works of the law as best as they could, the Lord would consider them saved and put them in that paradise below the earth. And then what happened is Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, he abolished that law because faith came in and then faith did away the law. And by doing away the law, what happened is those who are in the paradise below the earth after Jesus Christ died on the cross, they were able to go to heaven after that Amen. and not before. So Galatians 3, your hand is there, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Galatians 3. Oh. Notice right here that faith was not available. So because faith was not available until Jesus died on the cross, they were shut up, right. locked up in the law, which means then if they were locked up in the law, they couldn't be saved by faith in the Old Testament. So they had to have in the Old Testament works that would accompany the faith, not just faith alone. Because Galatians 3, notice right here, verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. We read that. But verse 25, but after that faith is come. See that? When that faith is come, we are no longer under a what? So then this schoolmaster, the law is out of the way. Because look at verse 23, 23. But before faith came, see that right here? We were kept under the law, see that? Shut up unto the faith, which should what? Afterwards, see when Jesus died on the cross. 
be revealed. So uh, this is a doctrine called dispensational salvations. Amen. A lot of uh, uh, independent Baptist churches do not believe in that, but this is a doctrinal truth, and it's very important Amen. because it makes sense with Amen. a lot of other doctrines. Because if they were able to be saved by faith to begin with in the Old Testament, then that should make them perfect to go to heaven. Unless why? Unless you have to have faith, what? When Jesus died on the cross. That's the perfect thing. But they never had the perfect thing. All that time they had an imperfect thing. That's the law. So it made a lot more sense that because they were under an imperfect law, as they were trying to go by that salvation, they had to be shut up in it, and they were shut up in a paradise below earth. They couldn't go to a perfect heaven. Then when faith came, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, they were able to go to heaven after that. Now, why was Job considered to be perfect? He's considered to be perfect in the Old Testament sense. And then the perfection, uh, according to Paul in the book of Hebrews, is in the New Testament sense. That's the idea. The Old Testament sent a perfection during that time because the law couldn't make anyone perfect, right? <laughs> Why? Because no matter how well, if you're an Old Testament saint, you try to do works to keep the law, you will break it. Yeah. So you had to take out an animal, and the animal, when you give it as a blood sacrifice, gives a clean slate. So because of that, then they can get that perfection. But remember... The blood of animals cannot clear sins. It can only forgive them. So God had to count it. So that's a doctrine of imputation and justification. Imputation is God will count it. He will consider it to be perfect, righteous, or cleared. But then justification is the actual action that is done where uh, you are cleared, where you are holied. So uh, holy, excuse me, made holy, excuse me. So that's the idea. It's, uh, they are, we are justified by faith. See Amen. that? In Amen. his blood. Justified Amen. by his blood. Amen. Romans Amen. chapter 5, I think. But right here, when it talks about a just man, right? Yeah. See? Justified. He had to follow what? The law accordingly. That's right. yeah. See, there's a very uh, big difference right here. They had, if they wanted to be known as perfect, they received what was called uh, to be counted, considered by God, yeah. which is another word for imputation, which is why God said Job was perfect, which is why you're going to find so many verses in the Bible that says, I was perfect, God. I was perfect. I lived perfect. I lived perfect. And then they'll mention commandments there. Just type down perfect in the Old Testament. You'll see a lot of the uh, words connected to Old Testament law commandments. Well, obviously, that's not true in the New Testament sense. Why? Because, again, remember the difference is God had to consider it that way. Imputation. This is imputation. In here, concerning justification, no. All right? It, it, the actual clearing away of sins, no. No. This sense, God considered you perfect. He had to impute you, count it as perfect, but he didn't make you perfect. It's right here, in this time, he not only counted you perfect, but he made you perfect. Wow. Romans 5 shows you are imputed and justified together. Amen. If you look at Romans 5. Amen. Anyway, that's a whole other doctrine. Amen. You can go to my commentary on Romans on that one. But Romans shows the doctrine of imputation, justification much better on that one. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's mm -hmm. teaching was a blessing to uh, the audience. Open their eyes more to the scriptures. Increase our understanding of it and our spiritual growth. Dismiss us now with your blessing. Help us to go home safe. In Jesus' name we pray.